Hello everyone, and this is the second video for Experiment Designs for Computer Science. I'm Klaus Aranha from the University of Tsukuba, and today we are going to talk about point and interval indicators. So, uh, let's give an outline. So last class, uh, we talked about what is an experiment and how do we use experiments in science to get data about one system that we want to understand. In this lecture, we're gonna focus on that a little bit more. We got, exper we got data from experiments. How do we use this data to learn about a system that we are studying? So well, that's what we talk about, like the importance of characterizing data. And for this characterization, we're gonna use two main statistical concepts. Population and sample. We're going to explain what is a population, what is a sample, what is the difference. And then we're going to talk about how we use a sample to characterize a population with two examples, point estimators and interval estimators. And we're going to talk a little bit about visualizing estimators. Uh, that will be on a separate video where we're going to use code to uh, do some of the examples of the video that we talk here. Before we start, let's talk about one scientist that was all about gathering and understanding data. So I'm talking about uh, Charles Darwin. I guess many of you know of him. Uh, Charles Darwin is very known for his theory on the origin of the species, which is a theory that describes how, through the process of evolution, we got the many different uh, species of animals in nature. His, uh, his theory was very interesting the, the way when he published it because it correctly predicted the hereditary nature of evolution. In other words, how the characteristics of parents are uh, passed to offspring before uh, we knew about genes. So the discovery of genes and genetic inheritance was after uh, Charles Darwin, which was quite new. So basically only observing the relationship between uh, parents and offsprings, he, no, uh, he made uh, a, a framework that described how parents passes um, their characteristics to offsprings and how these characteristics slowly lead for species differentiation. Well, of course, uh, as we're going to see uh, in future examples of science, Many of the great discoveries, although we usually say, oh, this person found out about this discovery, in the majority of cases, the entire co uh, scientific community was interested in that question. So this was the same uh, regarding Darwin. During Darwin's time, there were many people that were proposing and discussing many different ways to model uh, the, uh, the generation of species, the speci speci uh, speciation. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to talk about a little bit about that too. But who was Charles Darwin? So last class we talked about uh, Marie Curie, and it was interesting to notice that she had um, some very humble beginnings, and she had lots of difficulties uh, by being a woman and, and trying to get into a university. Uh, Charles was a little bit uh, different. So Charles Darwin was, a, was the son of a wealthy doctor, and in a very large family. He had many brothers and sisters. And uh, if, uh, by, based on the, what his father was wanted for him, he went to study as a doctor. So he was pressed as a doctor. It is said that he really did not like all the blood of operations, and he found the classes to be really dull. So when he was done with his, um, his, stud his, stud his study as a doctor, he actually, while he, instead of taking classes, he would prefer to go and study taxidermy, which, if you don't know, is the techniques to get animals and uh, dead animals and make them look like if they were like real models. Like when you go to a restaurant and you have those models of food, taxidermy, taxidermy is the same thing, but for animals. So right now we can see that he was very interested in studying different animals and observing how the animals are different and what characterizes them. <coughs> so 
So he decided to, after he finished his study, he decided he wanted to go on a trip to study animals in many different places. So one of the, um, <clears throat> one of the main activities that Charles Darwin is known for is what it's called the Beagle Strip. The Beagle, is, it's uh, HMS Beagle, it's the name of a ship, is a trip that Charles Darwin was assigned to. He was the catalogue, and in its time, it was in the height of the British Empire. So the British were sending many ships to different parts of the world to catalogue the different animals on the different continents, the different fauna, the different flora, the different geo, um, geological characteristics. So they wanted to know more about how the world was different uh, in, many, in many parts. And Charles Darwin was in one of these trips, right? He spent a five years voyage on the sea. And as you can see in this image, he visited, uh, let's mark here, oops. So let's keep the spotlight. So in this trip, so he started here in England and he visited South America, Brazil, Peru, Colombia, uh, the Galapagos Islands. So his visit to the Galapagos Islands is very famous. That's when he observed different types of birds in different islands. And depending on the island, the shape of the, the birds, the beak of the birds was different. Uh, he visited um, Oceania, so um, uh, Australia, and this uh, south of Africa before going back to, uh, to England. So during this trip, he kept extensive notes of his observations and theories. Um, he is, the journal of his Beagle's trip was Charles Darwin's first uh, famous scientific publication that was launched him in his, uh, in his career as a geologist and as a uh, biologist. Okay, so he observed the, the diversity of mockingbirds, tortoises, foxes, and by observing all these different animals and how they were similar to each other and how they were different, and more specifically, how their differences seem to be related to their environment, he started to think about what, make, what makes all these animals different. So, in 1837, uh, his notes from the Beagle Strip gave him his first insights. Uh, here you see one page of his diary when you, he can see he's trying to branch out the species. Um, okay, so what he's thinking about. And based on these ideas, he did not only thought about it, he said, okay, if this is true, maybe I can see this happening in other situations. So he started a very long study, a very long time studying and gathering data. He took a lot of data from breeders, both of animals and from, broad, from farmers. So uh, we, of course, there is the natural evolution, but we also use artificial evolution when, for instance, breeders take the biggest uh, corn, for instance, the biggest plants and replant them. So they become bigger and then replant them. And the same thing happens with dogs. So breeders take dogs that have, if they want to breed dogs for hunting, they take dogs that have good hunting qualities and breed them together. And these qualities become more accented. And they have also <clears throat> uh, quality, um, how do you say? They also have qualities for, um, if you want that is a dog that is small or a dog that is cute, you can breed them similarly. So he was based, all this information he was cataloging over 15 years. And eventually, after all of that in 1859, so that's more than 20 years from the end of his Beagle trip, he published his famous book, The Origins of the Species. Uh, if you have the chance, I really recommend that you can get this item, this book. Uh, it's available in Project Gutenberg. Project Gutenberg is a website where you can download very old public or very old books that are already in the public domain. And the origin of this species is very interesting because it's a book that is very focused on describing over and over and over again 
how Darwin saw evolution in many different uh, in many different contexts. So he shows how evolution works with breeding dogs, how evolution works with birds, how evolution works with plants, and over and over again he observes the same thing. So his um, science was basically saying, "Look, here is my theory, and here is how I saw it here. He saw I saw it here. He saw how I saw it here, and." Even we last time we talked about falsifiable theories. Towards the end of his book, he describes, he was very careful about that. He describes what kind of things we could expect to see if his theory was not correct. So if his theory is not correct, you can expect to see these kind of things, or these are other information that these are other things he was that you could expect to see, like the intermediate uh, creatures. Uh, in the fossil record. So it's a, it's a very interesting book. And one of the things that I find very interesting about the origin of the species is that Charles Darwin knew that his theory was, he was afraid that his theory would be controversial at the time. So he was very careful. He took over 20 years to gather information to publish his book. And actually, he kind of only published his book because his friends that he communicated, the other scientists that he communicated, gave him the uh, incentive that he needed. So there are many letters cataloged between Darwin and especially uh, Huxley, who was another scientist that Darwin talked about him, uh, uh, talking to a lot of time, but also other scientists that were contemporary to Darwin. And they were like, no, no, this, you need to publish this. This is important. I said, oh, okay. So he published when he was like very, his health was very bad. He was an active scientist in other fields, even though during his 20 years, he kept cataloging other uh, discoveries. He kept cataloging other types of animals and publishing about these catalogs. So he was extremely active in that area, but his origin of the species book, although he had the initial idea in the beginning of the career, it was only published towards the end of his career um because of all these um <clears throat> how do you say this carefulness so it's a very interesting uh a very interesting take about how sometimes uh to find something new and important you need to carefully catalog different kinds of data and carefully consider how you're going to publish how you're going to present it to other people and we're going to do that a little bit here when we talk about how we use data from samples to describe a population that we have to learn more about. All right, uh, a quick note before we start the lecture. Uh, starting from this lecture, we are going to give many examples in code about how to calculate some of the uh, concepts that we are going to talk about. So in the next video, I will show some coding examples and all these coding examples use the R programming language. Now, the R programming language is not something that you normally learn in computer science courses, but it's not a very difficult language to learn. It's a language that is very specific towards statistical analysis. Uh, it has a very large number of libraries for different statistical tests, uh, different ways to present data, different ways to pre-process data, to process data. So I highly recommend that students that are taking this course to get acquainted to R. Uh, there's a link that you can see here. So R for beginners, it has described the, the main characteristics of the R programming language. And there is a software R Studio that can help you get using to programming in R. <coughs> so let's talk about statistical indicators. Last lecture, we talked about how we use experiments to obtain data. And how can we use this data to gain knowledge about a system? Imagine that you want to learn more about the students of a university. You could take one student, let's say you, and you measure your height. So you are maybe 175 centimeters high. From, so that's an experiment, right? You're looking at the world and you take some information. You measure your height. You did some experiment, you got some data. What can you use? What can you learn about the, student, the height of all the students in a university from your height? Not much, right? I mean, 
it's not nothing. For instance, if your height is 175, then at least you know that 175 centimeters is a possible height for students in your university. But you cannot re really learn much more about that. You cannot say that all students have 175 centimeters, right? So from one student height, it is hard to learn anything about the height of the students of the university in general. What would be better is that if we took the height of several students, we can take, for instance, the height of 10 students or maybe 20 students. And we can take the average height of all these 10 students. And OK, so we got the, the average height of 10 students. What's the relationship between the average height of 10 students and the average height of students of that university in general? Is it the same? Is it close? Is it far away? Can we say anything about that? Okay, so we're not talking about a concept of statistics. It's different from probability that we learn in high school. In probability, we have information about a system and we calculate probabilities. Like if a, if a drawer has three black socks and three white socks, what is the probability that we got two black socks if we take socks without looking? Statistics is the, is the opposite. We have a drawer with lots of socks and we take three socks and we got three black socks. So what are the colors of the socks in the drawer? That's the statistics, okay? Of course, there are many calculations that are similar in statistics and probability, but uh, let's focus on the statistics for this course. And we're gonna go right away and talking about two concepts that we're gonna use the entire lecture and the entire course. These are the concepts of population and sample. So population is a large set of objects that are inter of interest. So the population is the system that we want to learn. It can be a real set, like I said in the last example, all students of a university is a population, okay? But it can also be a theoretical set. For example, all the possible ex results of an experiment. Let's say that I want to understand the system of rolling two dices. So what is the all possible results of the two dices? Well, one dice can be a one and the other dice can be a one. One dice can be a one, the second dice can be a two. One dice can be a one, the second dice can be a three, and so on. So of course, these results don't exist yet. They are theoretical, but the population is the set of all the possible results that I could get if I rolled the two dice. Okay, now what is an observation? One observation is one element of this population. When I execute the experiment, I get one observation out of it. So for instance, for the students, I get one student from the university. Or for the experiments, I execute the experiment once. I roll the dice once. That's one observation. What is a sample? A sample is a subset, is a set of observations. So for instance, for the case of the university, if I take 10 students, that's 10 observations. That's one sample with 10 observations. For the dice, if I roll the dice three times, I have a sample with three observations, okay? So a sample is good because if we examine the sample, if we take the average height of 10 students, for example, we can make an inference about the population, okay? What does it mean to make an inference about the population? Let's give another example. Imagine that we have a pool with many colorful balls like you have here. So we have a plastic pool and you really want to jump on this pool right now. It has blue balls and yellow balls and red balls. Okay, now if this was a high school uh, probability course, I would say this pool has 50, color, uh, 50 blue balls, 50 yellow balls, and 50 red balls. If I take 10 balls, what is the probability that I get all three? What's the probability that I get one of each color? And you could calculate that. However, 
you don't know. Imagine that you don't know how many balls. It's a very big, a very big pool, and you don't really want to count all of them. You just see balls of all colors from the distance. If you want to estimate the proportion, are all the same amount? Do I have more blue balls than, than yellow balls? Then what you can do is that you take some of the balls and you calculate the proportion. If you take, say, 50 balls, and in the 50 balls that you take, you have about the same amount of each, then you can estimate or you can infer that the proportion in the pool is also roughly the same of the three balls, of the three balls. Let's think about computer science. Let's say that you are downloading a file. You are downloading a new game from Steam. And in the download, it says, oh, this download will take two hours. How does it know? Well, one way to calculate that is to calculate, that is, of course, when you are downloading the file, the server is sending you many packets. Each packet has a size. The server calculates how long it takes for one package one packet to take to reach your computer. Of course, because there is an error, there is a variance, it actually sends maybe 10 packets or 100 packets and calculates the average time. By calculating this average time, it can multiply that by the total number of packets that it needs to send you and make an estimate, an inference about how long the total download would take. Think about this as an experiment. And think of from the point of view of this point of view of experimental design. What could go wrong with this estimate? How could you improve the estimate? Okay? Think about it a little bit, and then we're gonna go for the next concept. All right, so we're talking about inference of the population. What are we trying to infer? Well, the population is the world, the thing that we want to know about, but we don't know. So for instance, let's say that you are Darwin and you want to learn more. You saw some, uh, you saw some, some fossils of a large dinosaur and you want to know more about this large dinosaur. So what do you want to know? Well, you want to know the parameters that describe this dinosaur. So in the statistics, parameters are characteristics of the system that we want to learn. For example, in this dinosaur, we want to know the length. So maybe we estimate from many samples that the length is something between 7.5 and 8.5 meters. So we got many fossils and by calculating the size of the fossils, we estimate that the parameter length of this dinosaur is between 7.5 and 8.5 meters. And we can estimate that the height is between two and 2.9 meters. We also estimate that the maximum size from the fossils that we found is nine meters for the length and three meters for the height. We also had other mass, other parameters. We have the mass, the size of the school, the size of the horns, and the size of the nose horn. So all of these are parameters. A parameter, and usually we call a parameter theta, so a parameter theta of the population is an unknown value that we want to learn by using experiments. Remember that we cannot observe the population directly. So we never know what is the value of the parameter. Okay, so for instance, the average height, the dinosaur has an average height. If we take all possible dinosaurs of this species that were ever born and will ever be born again, so this is a theoretical population, but this theoretical population has an average height. We cannot know this average height, but we can estimate this average height from the samples that we take. Okay, so that's the role of statistics, to estimate parameters of a population. Okay, so like I said, by observing data obtained from a sample, we can characterize in other words, estimate parameters from a population. For example, we can calculate the average of the running time of multiple executions of a program, and from this average, we estimate the mean running time of the program. We can ask the age of several students in a school 
and estimate the maximum and minimum age of a student. We can estimate the efficacy of a remedy by counting what percentage of patients get better after drinking. So every time that you take some data from a sample and use this data to estimate uh, the, 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 the value of the parameter in the population, we're, do, we're, we're, doing, uh, uh, we're doing statistics. Now, we usually say a statistic, okay, and now, so what is a statistic? A statistic is a function, okay? So if we look at these examples, in all of these examples, we're taking data from the sample and thinking a little bit like a computer scientist, we're getting this data and putting this data in a function, and this function will give us the estimate. So for instance, if we look at this third example, we're gonna get our sample, which is patients take a remedy, and we take 100 patients, and for each patient, we take, did the patient get better, yes or no? So we have one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. We get all of this data, and we calculate a percentage, which is an average of ones and zeros, right? So this is a function. We're getting this sample and we're putting this in a function and this function will give us an estimate. So this function we're gonna call a statistic. Why is this important? Okay, uh, there are many different statistics that we can calculate in many different situations. Part of your experimental design is to define what statistics you need to learn what you need to learn in your experiment to learn what you need to learn in your uh, scientific question. So to learn about the efficacy of this uh, remedy, I need a statistic that is the percentage of patients that got, uh, got cured by this disease. Let's say that you have an experiment that you want to know what is the maximum weight that this bridge can hold. So your statistic is some function that from your experiments, we'll calculate this maximum weight. Okay, in this lecture, we're gonna talk about two types of statistics. There are many, we're gonna talk about two here. The point indicator or the point estimate and the interval indicator or the interval estimate, okay? So the idea of estimating parameters using information is statistical inference. So inferring information from the population. And we're gonna talk about point estimator and interval estimator. Point estimator are statistics, functions on the sample that estimate the value of a population parameter from information on the sample. Now, interval estimators, they estimate a range of values. So if you remember the dinosaur, we had an estimate of the length of the dinosaur that had a minimum value and the maximum value. So that's an interval estimator. On the other hand, when you download a file and it says it's gonna take two hours for their file to download, that is a point estimator. So let's talk a little bit about some point estimators and some interval estimators. Now, suppose that you want to obtain a point estimate for an arbitrary parameter, let's say mean size. Remember that the point estimate is a function from the sample, but the sample is a random variable. Remember that a sample is a subset of the population that is chosen randomly. So if you take one sample and you take another sample, so your first sample and your first, second sample, they will be different. And because your first sample and your second sample are different, the value of the statistic that you calculate from the first sample and the value of the statistic that you calculate from the second sample, they are different. Okay. If you take 10 students from one class and calculate the, the mean height of those students, and if you take 10 students from another class and you calculate the mean height of those students, the mean height of the two samples will be slightly different, okay? So as a random variable, any statistic has a probability distribution, which is depending on the probability distribution of the population. Okay, we're gonna call this the sample distribution. Okay, so when we do statistical tests, we use properties of these sample distributions, which we are going to study a little bit in the end of this lecture and more in the other lectures in this course.
okay? For now, uh, let's think about the most, the, the most simple properties. So a point estimator is a statistic which provides the value of the maximum plausibility for an unknown population parameter theta, okay? Let's think about a random variable x that is distributed according to a certain function. So this function x given theta is a function that describes what are the possible values of the random variable x that we obtain is a statistic from the population given the real value of the parameter. Remember that we don't know theta, okay? So consider now that we sample this variable x. We take, so we take 10, n observations, x1, x2, x3, xn. So we have a sample and the sample is a random variable. Now we're gonna define a function theta hat. This is a point estimator of the parameter theta. So a function theta hat is a function on the sample x that give us an estimate for theta. Now the value of this estimate will be theta hat. So what are the properties of this theta hat? Okay, so a point estimator, we can use them frequently in all areas of science. Some examples of point estimators. The mean is a point estimator. You take the value of several val uh, uh, variables, uh, ver se uh, several observations, and you average them, and that will give you an estimate for the true mean of the population. The standard, the population variant is the population variance is another point estimator. The population proportion is another point estimator. The difference between the mean of two populations is also a point estimator, okay? In each of these cases, there are many ways to perform the estimation task. And which estimator do you use, as I said before, is based on the mathematical properties of each statistic and also the characteristics of the experiment that you want to do. Okay, <clears throat> notice one thing that is important. We are, I will, we are always using the word estimate. We don't know the parameter of the population, so we estimate it using a statistic. Why is that? Remember that the statistic is a random variable. If we are unlucky, okay, or if our um, experiment design is careless, or if we are malicious, it's possible to obtain an estimate that is very different from the true value of the population. Let's give an example, okay? For instance, we want to estimate the height of the students of a school. We pick 10 students, that's our sample, and we say that the, the average height is equal to the height of the youngest student in that sample. Now, this is a bad example. Of course, this is not a reasonable uh, statistic, but it is a statistic. Remember, a statistic is a function of the sample. So if I take 10 observations and I choose the observation of the youngest student, that's a statistic. But this statistic in general will give us um, a height, uh, I estimate for the height that is smaller than the true height of the mean because I always take the youngest student. So this is a biased estimator, okay? It's biased towards low values. So we have the concept of error and bias. The error is the difference between an estimate and the true value of the population parameter, okay? So if I take, if the, re, if the true average of my, of the height of the students in the university is one is 176 centimeters and i calculate my statistic and my statistic says that the average height is 175 then i have an error of one centimeter in my estimate the bias on the other hand so the error refers to one estimate one sample i call i took the sample i calculate my statistic and i have an error i don't know the value of the error but that can be estimated as well we're going to talk about this the bias is a systematic 
error. A systematic, uh, so when I calculate this statistic, systematically, I have estimates that are below the, below the true value of the parameter. Or systematically, I have uh, estimates that are above the, the true value of the statistic. So one of the roles of experiment design is to make sure that the statistics that we choose to represent our experiment are not biased. So what is an unbiased estimator? A good estimator should consistently generate estimates that are close to the real value of the parameter theta. There will always be some error because it's a random variable word, but this error, if this error is consistent, either below or above, so it's, it's not like always below or not always above, but it's consistent, it's well distributed, it's, uh, be, it behaves well around the true value of the, of the parameter, we say that the, the estimator is unbiased. Putting it in a mathematical language, we can say that we have an estimator, theta hat, and it's unbiased for the parameter theta if the expected value of this estimator is theta. So the estimator can have an error, but the expected value is theta. Or in other words, the expected value of the estimator minus theta is equal to zero. Now this difference, the, estimate, the expected value of the estimator minus theta is referred as the bias of the estimator. To give an example, let's think about the mean. The mean, uh, the average, is the usual estimator for the uh, mean parameter of a population. So if we have <clears throat> uh, x1, x2, xn to be a random sample from a population x, and this population x is characterized by a parameter mean of mu and a variance of sigma squared in a normal distribution. So we can show that the expected value of the average of the sample is equal okay, to the expected value of, so what's the average? We are summing all the values of xi and dividing it by the total size of the sample. And it's possible to show that the expected value of this is equivalent to mu. It's equal to mu, okay? So the expected value of taking the average of a sample is the average of the population. That's kind of the definition of average, but it's interesting to know that the average is an unbiased estimator, okay? Remember that the expected value of the, why this happened? Remember that our population is characterized by this, okay? We are assuming that the population has a mean mu and it has a variance sigma squared. So the expected value of any one xi will be <clears throat> mu. So we can replace this, um, let's go over here. We know that the expected value of x, y is mu. That's the definition of the, the mean parameter. So if we do the calculation here, we're gonna see, we're gonna take out this sum and we're gonna take out this division and we're gonna see that the expected value of the estimator is also mu. So that tells us that the, uh, the average is a unbiased estimator for the mean parameter. Okay. So, oops. So, uh, of course, for one parameter, it's usually possible to define more than one unbiased estimator, okay? Uh, we could take, for example, uh, in the, instead of taking us, uh, we can take the, the minimum min minus the maximum value of the sample, we take the average, and that also would probably be an unbiased estimator. However, these, the variances of these estimators may be different. In general, if we have two unbiased estimators, mu one, uh, sorry, theta one, and theta, uh, theta hat one, and theta hat two, 
we want the estimator that has the minimal variance, okay? This is because if we have two estimators that are unbiased and one of them has a smaller variance than another one, the, the estimator with the smallest variance will probably, will, uh, will likely give us um, est uh, estimations of the parameters that are closer to the true value of the parameter. So what this says is that since the estimator uh, have, have variance, we can try to calculate the variance of an estimator. So because the estimator is a random, the point estimator is a random variable, we have an associated distribution and an error. So for example, the standard error of the estimator theta hat is the variance of the, uh, the expected var the variance of theta hat square root, and that would be sigma theta hat. Know, however, that we can't know this error directly, okay? Because we don't really know what are the true values of the population. So we estimate the standard error of the estimator from the data in the sample. So in this case, we call it the estimated standard error, sigma hat theta hat, okay? There are some other notations. So we have to estimate the error of the estimator in order to know if it's a good or a bad estimator, even if it's unbiased. So we have two unbiased estimators. We calculate the, um, <clears throat> we calculate the, the estimated error for both and we take the estimator that has the lower, um, the lower uh, standard error. In the case of the mean, for instance, we're gonna see in the next slides, this error is proportional to the size of the sample. So let's give an example. Assume a random variable X from a Gaussian distribution and a sample error S. We can calculate the standard error of S several common point indicators. So the estimate of the error for the mean is S divided by square root of N. So we can see that the larger, the larger our sample, the smallest is the estimated error for the estimator. For the error of the variance, we have a similar formula. And for the error of the standard deviation, we have also a similar formula. In all these cases, we see that as the sample size increases, the estimated error of the estimator becomes smaller. So this is one way to justify why we need to have larger sample sizes. Because the more sample, the more observations that we have in our sample, the more likely that a statistic calculated from that sample will be close to the true value of the population. Of course, in the extreme case, if it's possible to get all the individuals from the population, then we can just calculate the value of the statistic. But in the realistic case, we want the largest sample that we can use in our experiment. Remember that it also counts cost, and we're going to talk about this in the future. Okay, let's give a concrete example of all, how this works. Imagine that we have a operation to produce cab cables, okay? So in this factory, we, we, we have a cable factory and in the cable factory, the mean uh, resistance of the population, the, the mean re resistance of the cables that are produced is 50 with a standard deviation of two, okay? So these values, 50 and two, they are the population mean and the population deviation. We produce the factory with these values in mind, okay? Now, we are going to take a sample uh, of, of, oh, sorry. Also, another thing about our production is let's assume that, of course, there is an error when we produce this cable, but let's assume that this error is uh, this error is normally distributed. So in general, when we produce a cable, the resistance of the cable will have a value that follows a normal distribution with mean 50 and variance four, okay? So squared of the population distribution. Now, let's take a sample. Let's say that we're going to inspect, we're going to inspect this factory and do an experiment to know if this factory is really following the specifications. So how do we do experiment, this experiment? 
we take a sample of 25 cables. So we produce 25 cables of this factory, okay? And then <clears throat> uh, we measure the resistance of these cables. Now the sample mean, so the estimate for the variance of this population will be given by the average of X. So it's 25 cables. So it's the sum of the resistance of these 25 cables divided by 25. Now this value will not be exactly 50, okay? But it will follow a normal distribution. The expected value of the sample is 50, okay? Because the sample is an unbiased estimator. So we expect that if we take several samples of size 55, the expected value of these averages will be 50. And the error of this sample will be the square root, will be the square root of the standard error of the factory, sorry, the square root of the variance of the factory divided by the size of the sample. So it's 0 0.4 omega. Note that the 0 0.4 is not the standard error of one observation. The standard error of one observation is two, like we saw last slide. The 0 0.4 is the standard error of the estimate. So when we take an average of 25 cables, we expect a value for this average of 50 with a, st with a standard error of 0 0.4. So much closer, you see, the value of the sample mean is much closer to the true value of the parameter than the value of a single observation. And if this uh, sample was increased, then we would have values for the estimated mean that are closer and closer to the true value of the population. Okay? This is what we call uh, the central limit theory theorem. Okay? So in the previous example, the, oh sorry, this leads us, sorry, this leads us to the central limit theorem. So in the previous example, we assumed that the production followed a normal distribution. However, many things, many things in nature do not follow the normal distribution. For instance, lines follow <clears throat> a different uh, normal distribution, and we have uh, many effects that follow a polar law. However, even for a population with an arbitrary distribution, we can make this arbitrary distribution behave as normal by observing the sampling distribution. So even for many, not all, but many arbitrary distributions, these sample distributions will tend to be normal. To, uh, gener in general, let's say that we have a sample, x1 to xn observations, and these observations are independent and identically distributed. So what does it mean? It means, independent means that the value of x1 does not depend on xn or vice versa. And identically distributed, it means that x1 to xn, they all come from the same distribution, like the cables that we saw in the last example. In that case, if we take, uh, if we, and assume that they have a mean and a variance, even though they are not normally distribution, distributed, if we calculate the z value as the sum of the observations minus the mean times the number of the observations and we divide it by the number of the observations times the, the, um, <clears throat> the variance, we're gonna have this value z and this value z can be shown to be normally distributed asympto uh, asymptotically, okay? So the z of n, when n is big enough, will follow roughly a normal distribution. We can use this property to do uh, to apply statistics that require normal distributions, even in even in effects, even in populations that not necessarily follow this normal distribution. Okay, so this result is what is called the central limit theorem. It's one of the most useful properties for statistical inference, like I said, because it allows us to use some techniques based on normal distribution, even when the population under study is not normal. Okay. For well-behaved distributions, we just need small sample sizes, but 
large, uh, even not so well behaved distributions still follow the central limit, limit theorem at large enough sample sizes. There is some uh, related link for you to see uh, some more information about this. Uh, we have, we're going to have a set, um, an example of the central limit theorem in the coding video that I will uh, post next. So you can also click on this link to download the R code and test it yourself. Okay, now let's talk about, quickly let's talk about statistical intervals. So until now we talked about point statistics, uh, point uh, estimators. In statistical est uh, intervals on the other hand, they're used to qualify the uncertainty related to a given estimate. Let's think about the, the, the cable produ production before. We have a, a cable manufacturing operation that has a target resistance of 50 and a standard deviation of two. Let's assume that the resistant values follow a normal distribution, okay? Now, let's say that we have a sample, again, a sample of 25 observations and the mean of the sample was 48. Now given, the now, given the variability associated with this sample, it's likely that this mean is not exactly the same as the mean parameter of the population. But we want to know, is it possible to know how far this value is? Okay, so the statistical interval, they are functions on samples that define regions that are likely to contain the true value of an estimated parameter. Okay, so it's possible to quantify the level of uncertainty associated with an estimation and put this in relation to the value of the estimator. So this gives us stronger conclusions about what can we know about the population. There are three very common types of interval, confidence intervals, tolerance intervals, and prediction intervals. Today, we're gonna to talk only about confidence intervals but I will give you a related link for you to study about tolerance intervals and prediction intervals as well. So a confidence interval. What is a confidence interval? A confidence interval quantifies the degree of uncertainty associated with the estimation of population parameters. Usually you see this in experiment as, okay, the value of mean of the mean is uh, 48 plus minus four. What is this plus minus four? This is the confidence interval, okay? So usually it's like stated something like the interval that contains the true value of a given population parameter with a confidence level of one minus alpha. Alpha is a parameter for the confidence interval. You should say 95% confidence interval, 90% confidence interval, okay? But how do we think of it? This 95% is not that this interval is the interval that with a 95% chance the true value is here. It's this 95% refers to the function, to the estimate, not to the value. So the idea of a 95% interval is that this is a function that has a 95% chance of capturing the true value of the population. This image gives you a better idea. Let's go in the cable example, we have the true value of the populations is 50. So we calculate a 95% confidence interval uh, 100 times. And for each time we plot the confidence interval as a green bar. So you can see here that uh, this confidence interval, it often includes the, uh, it often includes the 50 times, the, 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 the value 50. Sometimes right in the middle, sometimes in the corner, sometimes the bar is bigger, sometimes it's smaller. But a few times, okay, the confidence interval is completely wrong. So a 95% confidence, confidence interval is a function that has a 95% chance of actually including that value here. Okay, we're gonna see an example of this on the next video. So how do we calculate the confidence interval? Well, the idea here of the confidence interval 
is that we are using that Z statistic that we described a few slides ago, okay? So the Z statistic describes the distribution of the sample as a normal distribution in the centered on the mean one and vari uh, mean zero and vary uh, and various one. Okay, so this one minus alpha is the confidence level, and zx is the x quantile of the uh, standard normal distribution. So we use the sample of the mean. Okay. And the known, if we know the very the the standard error of the population and the sample of, and the and the sample size, so the bigger the sample size, this confidence interval will be smaller and smaller. So again, we see the benefits of having a bigger sample size to get a more precise estimate of the maximum and minimum values of the um, the confidence interval. Of course, in many cases we don't know what is uh the what is the uh the standard deviation of the population in that case we use a t distribution with n minus one degrees of freedom and this t distribution will be used as the limits to calculate the limits for our um for our confidence interval So the two-sided confidence interval on the variance, so that was the standard confidence interval for the mean. We can also calculate a confidence interval for the variance of a normal variable. So here we have the error of the sample and we have the variance that we want to estimate. And this variance can be estimated using the key square distribution. Okay. Okay, so the idea of statistical intervals is that they quantify the uh, associated uncertainty with the different aspects of estimation. And in general, if you can report statistical intervals for variable, it's better than inform, uh, reporting just point estimates because this gives more information. Not only what is the value that you are estimating for a certain parameter, but also what is the uncertainty associated with that value, okay? So, in this lecture, we talked about how we use experimental data from samples to learn the characteristics of a system that we want to understand better. In particular, we talked about the use of statistics that are functions that calculate estimates of population parameters from sample data. We talked about point estimators and interval estimators, and these are important descriptive statistics that describe the parameters of a population. Uh, there will be another video that we're going to show some examples in code. So even if you did not get all of the um, uh, um, this, uh, definitions here, follow also the video to get some concrete examples of how we use this point estimates and these interval estimates. Now, next week, you have to submit a report on the report number one, right? Which was make a simple experiment uh, uh, they, uh, make a simple experiment to answer some scientific question and analyze it. So you have to do the experiment design that we talked about last class, and you also have to do the data analysis that includes the statistics that we described in this lecture, such as the means, errors, and confidence interval. Okay. Also think about from this lecture, how the sample size influence the variance of your estimator. So how does that affect your experimental design? Of course, a larger sample size means a more precise estimator. On the other hand, a large sample size means more time running experiments on your computer, or if your experiment costs you time or costs you some money or costs you some effort, there's a limit on how big an experimental design you can make. So I look forward to see how you think about these and how you write about these questions in your report. Um, there are lots of recommended reads, reads for this lecture. So the first two will give you more detail about sampling distribution. So I'm, uh, I encourage you to read this first two. They are not very long reads. They'll give you more information about sampling distribution and statistic intervals. The second link, Crash Course Statistics, 
Uh, it's a very good, um, it's a very good video series about these topics, different statistics, how you use them, how you calculate them. In particular, for this lecture, the videos three to seven in course course statistics cover roughly the same topics that we talked about today. So I highly encourage you to watch each of these videos. It's only about 10 to 15 minutes. Finally, uh, for R, there are two links. The first link is R for beginner that explains how you work with R and R Studio that shows, uh, that is the tool that you can use to easily use R for your uh, data analysis. Thank you very much for listening to this talk and see you in the next video. Bye-bye.